my name is Wesley Chen, and this is my, my coworker Ace. Hey. And, hello. And uh, wait a minute. What are you all doing here? What are you doing here? I'm just gonna. Sorry, I'm gonna be a little upfront with you, but we're not here to launch a product. Okay. We're not gonna tell you about some new technology. All right. In fact, we're gonna show you things that you can already do today, but maybe you weren't aware of it, or you don't know how. So I'm excited that many of you are here because I suspect you're curious about how to make G Suite and GCP play well together. All right, and that's one of the goals here, in addition to talking about serverless. So either that or you're totally obsessed with serverless and you're going to every single serverless talk. All right, there are people like that out there. Okay, cool. Awesome. So a little background about me. My job is to make you all successful using G Suite, GCP, and all Google APIs. I am the host of the G Suite Dev Show on YouTube, so if you do a lot of G Suite development, uh, each of these videos is like five or 10 minutes, really quick, to show you like one actionable, learnable thing, and then you can take that with you. All right? Uh, I've written some Python books, and I'm also one of the original engineers that built Yahoo Mail 20 years ago. It's a t this October will be the 20 year anniversary of Yahoo Mail. Uh, and Ace, what about yourself? Uh, so a little bit about me. I'm a developer programs engineer on the Google Cloud team. So my mission here is to enable developers to maximize their productivity using serverless. So I'm a full stack dev who kind of wandered into cloud. I've had other lives doing .NET, desktop dev, mobile dev, so on and so forth. And you can ask him about that afterwards. All right. So uh, this session is basically uh, what I just told you guys earlier. So GCP and G Suite and serverless. We're going to show you how to build solutions using all of Google Cloud. And so we're going to give two demonstrations, one showing you how to go one way, and the other showing you the vice versa. All right, so how are we going to do this? So this talk is broken up into six major parts. We're going to go through some introduction, talk about what serverless is in general, in case you're new to it. Uh, then we're going to show you, um, describe each of the different products on the GCP side for serverless, as well as on the G Suite side. And then we're going to go into the two demo apps, where one, we're going to analyze G Suite data using GCP. And then the other app is how to access GCP technologies from the G Suite side. And then we'll give you some inspirational ideas as to where you can take this, uh, you know, what's your next step. And then uh, we'll wrap it up after that. OK, so why you are here. So overall, just to kind of like set the stage, Google Cloud is a combination of both GCP as well as G Suite. So that's pretty important to know. And even though they are their own products, we want to show that they can work well together. Now, who are you and what is serverless? Those are the sort of like the big questions. Uh, there's lots of different yous out there. So maybe you're an engineer, you work at a large company, or maybe a smaller one, a medium-sized business, a startup, or perhaps a hobbyist, or you work at some independent software house. Or you're in DevOps, you're some kind of admin or DevOps person. Or you're a consultant, analyst, or some kind of integrator. Or any other type of technical professional or decision maker. On the GCP side, you could be a full stack developer, fully living in the cloud, but maybe you have some apps or data that's in G Suite, and you want to be able to take advantage of that. On the other side, if you're an enterprise developer and you're fully immersed in the G Suite world, well, maybe you have some big data stored in GCP, or you have big data period, and you don't know how to take advantage of GCP. So we want to show you how to do that as well, too. All right, so what is serverless? So Wikipedia defines serverless as this cloud computing execution model, which blah, 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 blah. Okay, there's a lot of talk, right? So I'm going to try and take a chance at simplifying this, or both of us are. We have our own takes on what serverless really is. My take is very simple. Um, I'm a Python developer. You probably already know that. So I take a lot of code, and I reduce it down to a very few lines of code. So I have shrunk this down to serverless computing is really just logic hosting in the cloud. Because what is logic? It is an app, or it's a function. And if you're hosting a function or an app in the cloud, that's serverless, because you're not spinning up resources and things like that. You're not managing machines or VMs or anything like that. It's just hosting apps or hosting functions. And Ace, what, what, what's this with a molecule? So the core idea here is that serverless isn't all or nothing. So you can think of your app as a molecule that consists of one or more ad atoms in the same way, rather, that your app consists of one or more services. So like a, like a molecule, you can put some of your atoms, so to speak, on serverless and some of your atoms on VMs or whatever hardware you have in mind, depending on your unique situation. Ah, I think I needed to take more science classes in college. <laughs> Thanks, Ace. All right, so let's take a step back with a true story. At the end of the last millennium, VMs became a thing. They exploded the server market. There was really no need for bare metal anymore. 
all right? But now with serverless, are we, we're saying you don't need VMs anymore? What gives? Well, so what really happened is that VMs were the revolution, and serverless is just the evolution from that point. So when you're at a higher level, you can solve more challenging problems. All right, well, that's enough history. Let's take a look at some server solu serverless solutions, starting with GCP. And I'll hand it off to uh, Ace to tell you a little bit more about that. So the core idea here is that serverless compute on GCP can be thought of as logic hosting. So basically, X hosting in the cloud for whatever your X is. Now, if your X is a function, you're going to use something like Google Cloud Functions. If your X is an entire app, you're going to want to use App Engine. And if you're trying to host a container or a cluster of containers in the cloud, you're going to want to use either GKE Serverless or Knative. Oops. Sorry. Now, the thing to bear in mind here is that serverless is more than just compute. There's a widespread of examples and serverless tools that we have on GCP that are not exclusive to the compute space. So take Cloud Data Store, for example. You probably know what this paradigm of a NoSQL database looks like. Maybe you've worked with something like MongoDB. But let's take the MongoDB example. When you're setting up a MongoDB instance, you have to worry about, say, the underlying security of that instance. You have to worry about like OS scaling, load balancing, things like that with that particular MongoDB instance. With Cloud Data Store, you get a NoSQL database API full stop. You don't have to worry about the underlying VMs or the underlying OS or anything like that. It is completely abstracted away from you. Next slide. So without further ado, I will hand it back to Wes, who will talk about the G Suite aspect of serverless. Great. So, uh, so for the G Suite side, we have two major ones. Uh, because GCP lives at the platform and the infrastructure level. G Suite lives at the SaaS level. So of course, we're only dealing with applications uh, and applications hosted in the cloud. So we have two platforms for that. The first one is Google Apps Script, and then the next one is Google App Maker. So you can check out the links for the products, but let's dive into each a little bit more deeply. So what is Apps Script? It is a server-side uh, you know, server runtime, just like Node. However, it's customized for G Suite automation, extension, and integration. So whether you're trying to add custom features, you know, for example, one of our samples is, gee, Google Slides doesn't have progress bars. Wouldn't it be cool to find out how far along in a presentation I am? Uh, so we, one of our samples lets you actually build progress bars. So in that sense, you're extending one of our applications. Maybe your company has a well-known product, but you want to give them access to that product from within Sheets or Docs or Slides or Gmail or anything like that. So add-ons allows you to do that. Okay, so it's native ob service object access versus using APIs. So what that means is that instead of you know, having to worry about OAuth, thinking about how to use HTTP to talk to an API, they're just objects that are already there available for you in App Script. So if you want to talk to a Google Sheet, you would do spreadsheet app dot and then name the method that you want to call. Okay, so it's, it's basically like that. And of course, it covers more than just G Suite products. You can use other, some GCP products, so we're going to have that in one of the demos. And you can use other Google services as well, too. So in AppScript, you can also reach Google Analytics, Google Maps, YouTube, and many others. Of course, we don't want you trapped inside the Google world. We want you to be able to go outside and talk to other services that are online or on-prem. So we have the URL fetch service that you can see here, uh, as well as JDBC if you have a, a database that you want to reach as well. So all of your applications are hosted and executed in the cloud, therefore serverless. And uh, if you've ever heard of add-ons for doc sheets, slides, forms, and Gmail, AppScript powers add-ons. If you want to find out more about AppScript, there are four talks that you can take a look at. Uh, just go back, you know, go back home and watch the videos. I think most of them have, have, have already happened, so that's why. The next product is AppMaker. Uh, this one is for uh, an audience who may not code all the time. So it's a low-code, assistive development environment. It has built-in templates. So if you already know you want to write a web app for you know, purchase orders or something like that, there's a whole set of templates that are already made for you. You basically build an app by dragging and dropping from a palette onto a canvas, and then you kind of connect to the data source and choose the columns that matter to you, and then uh, that l allows you to go from an app, uh, an idea to an app in just minutes instead of requiring engineering resources or taking more time. Under the covers, it generates app script code. Okay, okay. And since app script is serverless, then you automatically get that. The default storage mechanism for AppMaker is Google Cloud SQL. So you are kind of straddling both worlds between G Suite and GCP. 
and we just launched it publicly last month, so it's very, very new, and there are a couple talks that are related to uh, AppMaker that you see listed there. Feel free to watch those videos as well. Now, if for your work you need to actually have hands-on, or for your engineers that need to have hands-on doing this stuff, we do have one more boot camp left on Friday afternoon, so just uh, end of the day from 1.30 to about 6 o'clock, where you get hands-on with all three. You will learn how to use G Suite REST APIs, you will learn how to use AppScript, and you will learn AppMaker, and you will have working code before you're, before you're done. So it's four and a half hours, and we teach you all three, and you get hands-on in doing multiple code labs. So that's, so that's the training session. We still have a few seats available, so if you have time and an extra registration fee for the boot camp, then feel free to join. I'll be leading that session along with my colleague who will be doing the App Maker session. OK. Now, is it hard to get started playing with serverless on GCP and G Suite and making them play well together? Are there not enough documentation or code samples for you to look at? Or do you know GCP but not G Suite? Or vice versa, and you want to see how it's done? Well, we have lots of links to share, and then we're going to have two simple apps to demo, so uh, you won't look like like you're confused, all right? So first app is called Custom Intelligence in Gmail, and it is going to allow you to analyze G Suite data using GCP. So the main premise behind this app is we get email. We get lots of email. And services like Gmail and others do its best to get rid of all this spam. However, even with the spam gone, there's still a lot of email messages that come into your inbox, and not all of them are totally important. So it would be great if we could sort of like single out maybe the dark messages here that we care about, and we want those specifically annotated so we know those are specifically important messages to us, right? So let's build something like that. So the way it's going to work is on the GCP side, uh, you may have noticed that there's a lot of data that you have in G Suite. So we want to use GCP, you know, whether it's analyzing email messages or other data you have in G Suite. Uh, we have, GCP has a lot of ML and big data analytics that you can take advantage of, so it's important to do that. So one of the tools that we can use is the Gmail API. You can get an alert for every new message. And the way you do that is you can tell the API to set up a push notification to Cloud PubSub. And then Cloud PubSub can trigger an appropriate Cloud Function. Cloud Function can take the uh, email message, you know, scan the images that are uh, attached to your email message, and then send that to Cloud Vision. And Cloud Vision can identify the images that you care about and then label them and such that if a matching label comes in, you can talk to the Gmail API again and star those messages which match that label. Okay, so that's how it's going to work. So I'm going to hand it off to Ace, and he's going to describe to you a little bit of, about the code and how it works, and then he'll do a demo for you. So. It's the middle button. So diving straight into this code, just as a little bit of background, the way this code works is this is the function that is triggered by the pub subtopic whenever the recipient receives a new email. So starting off, uh, basically the first two lines of this code are all about extracting the recipient's email address from that, from that pub sub notification. Then we fetch their OAuth token, which is stored in Data Store. And once we fetch that token, we can carry out operations on the Gmail API, not necessarily as them, but on their behalf. So then we have to list the, message I the most recent message IDs, which we do with this less message IDs helper function. Then we take that, we get the most recent message ID, and we get that message's sort of object representation. Now, when we get that object representation, that includes the actual contents of the image. So we can go through those contents and extract any mentioned images from it. Finally, we take all those images and we say, we're going to pass this off to Cloud Vision using the get labels for images function. And then that passes it off to Cloud Vision. Cloud Vision um, runs its machine learning models and categorizes those images and sends those categories back to Cloud Functions. Now, the absolute final step here is if Cloud Functions gets this set of labels, and that set of labels contains the word bird, then we s mark the message as starred. If that set of labels does not contain the word bird, we simply exit the function and don't star the message. So this is the function that talks to Cloud Vision to get those image labels. At a high level, basically what it's doing is it's sending a a request to Cloud Vision using the Cloud Vision client library in, no, in Node.js. 
And then once that process is done, it takes that response, kind of massages it into an easy to read format, in particular just a list of categories for all the messages in or all the images in the message, and then returns that back to its original calling function. And then we can star interesting messages for some definition of interesting, in our case containing a, uh, a, an image of a bird, sorry, uh, using this label message helper function, which simply wraps the um, users.messages.modify Gmail API function. And we can simply pass a label, a list of labels that we want to apply to the message, which conveniently can include the reserved label starred, marking the images, or the message, sorry, as starred. So walking through this, this process in terms of what happens when a message actually arrives in the recipient's inbox. So once that message arrives in the recipient's inbox, a message notification is kicked off to a pre-configured cloud pub sub topic. Now that cloud pub sub topic is then used to trigger a Google Cloud function. And that cloud function can then retrieve the comments of the email from G Suite from Gmail. So if there are any images in that email, they are extracted and sent off to Cloud Vision, which then categorizes those images and returns the results back to that invoking Cloud function. Now, if the proper category is present in that list of image or categories of images, then the image is marked as starred using the Gmail API. And to demo this, What we'll do is walk through it here. Oh, you want me to drive it? Okay. Sorry about that. No, that's right. So here we have some sample uh, messages. And if we click through them, we'll notice that the ones with photos of birds are starred. So that's a bird. It's starred. That is my cat, Ethel. She's not a bird. She is not starred. She's a very lovely cat, but she is a cat, not a bird. This is a bird, and it's been starred by our cloud function. And this is a fish. It's not a bird, so it hasn't been starred. How'd you like that demo? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't test this email inbox by hand. I just made it. Can you tell? There's a welcome to Gmail. I haven't actually used this as a user, so. And of course, you know, you, you can use birds, you can use whatever sort of filtering mechanism you want. You might say, okay, maybe if this contains a mention of, I don't know, someone in my family, I want to automatically star it or something like that. All right. Do these. Now you know how it works. So to summarize this app at a high level, uh, basically, the first step is to use the Gmail API to set up that notification forwarding to a Cloud PubSub topic. The second step is to have PubSub, when a, a message comes in, trigger that logic that is hosted by Cloud Functions. Third, we use Cloud Functions to provide us with serverless and scalable access to the various GCP sort of machine learning APIs and whatnot. And we can combine these three things to provide us effectively custom intelligence in Gmail. And when I say custom, I mean it's code. You can write whatever logic you want. Now, the, the source code for this app is hosted on GitHub at github.com slash Google Cloud Platform slash cloud dash functions dash Gmail dash Node.js. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Wes, who will talk about the other direction. So going, um, going to GCP tools from G Suite. Cool. Thanks, Ace. That was an awesome app. Uh, so the next one is called Big Data Analysis to Slide Presentation. So what does that mean? Uh, so what that means is that big data is a thing now. Data scientist is a, is a title now. They offer data science degrees in college now, so it's a thing. There's a lot of tools out there for data scientists to help analyze data sets, machine learning to give you insights and analysis, and so on. And GCP is always releasing awesome new features. So for example, suppose you are doing some deep analysis on some big, giant data corpus, and you choose to use uh, GCP's BigQuery. It's a great tool to do the job. Now, we, it has a UI, so you can craft whatever, you know, use whatever data set you want, craft the, uh, the query that you want. Uh, but you know, you're happy with your query, but now you want to put it in code. So what does that look like? 
So this is an app script app, all right? So this is a G Suite serverless app that does that. So in order to talk to BigQuery, you do need your cloud project ID that you get from the API developer console. Uh, just enter it up there. But once you have that, then here's an example query. We're just going to look at, you know, sort of like the, uh, the most common words in all of Shakespeare. Small data set, not too, too large, but uh, gives results pretty quickly. So that's the query that you would send. It's very SQL-like. And what you do is you issue the, the request to BigQuery. Uh, then you get its job ID. Then you wait for the job to finish. And then once it's done, you get the results. And then you have some rows. Uh, so yeah, we got rows. Now what? Like, what do you do with this data? It's just sitting in a variable. I haven't put it anywhere. And if I turn off my computer, it goes away. Then I have to run it again, right? So you got to put it somewhere. So what's a good place for data? Um, so anyway, the data and the analysis is only part of the story. So my contention is that this is only part of the job. It's like these stairs. Well, it, it works. You can use them, but it's really better if the job was complete, right? And what I mean by complete is, at the end of the day, with all the hard work that you've done with your big data analysis and stuff, don't you have to uh, justify your efforts by showing your results to your managers? Right? I mean, you've got to get funded, right? And if you're, in, if you're at a university, this is even more true because you need to really get funding, right? So why don't we kind of like go the last mile? Don't quit just because you've got results and you can stand up. Take it one step further and uh, you know, make sure that you can take advantage of G Suite and most importantly, its APIs so that you can visualize the results better and make your results more presentable to management. Okay? So, uh, if you've got data results, how are you supposed to give it to management? Okay, there's a little button there that says download a CSV. Do you really want to do that? Do managers know how to read CSV? No. What, do they know how to read JSON? Mm, maybe, not really. Uh, maybe save it as a BigQuery table? No, not really. But guess what? Managers know how to do spreadsheets, okay? A spreadsheet is just a UI on top of a database, isn't it? Right? Okay, okay. we can have a debate about this later, <laughs> okay? Uh, but yay, now we actually have found a home for our data to go to that our managers can understand. So how do we do that? So if we save the rows. Now let's go make a spreadsheet. So the name of our spreadsheet is going to be our query name. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to create a spreadsheet with that name, get the current active spreadsheet that I have. And then I'm going to convert all the names of the header uh, to uppercase, just so I could see it better compared to the rest of the data. And then I'm going to add that data to the rows. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab all the data from the rows, and then I'm going to stick it into the spreadsheet. So we're going to skip the header row, so starting row on row two, because the headers are on row one, and then starting with column one. Okay, Because we want to go from BigQuery, which shows you the word and the count, to a, sp a spreadsheet has the word and the count. So that's why I capitalized it, so you could see it and distinguish all those words that are different from Shakespeare's actual words and then how many times they show up. OK, so that's that part. So yay, we have this. That's great. Now what? Well, having this data in a spreadsheet is more visual than having the data sitting in some database somewhere. We can do better, OK, like a chart. It'd be cool if we could take that data and build a chart in the spreadsheet. That's even more visual for your managers, OK, because remember, they're not technical. OK, all right, so how do we do that? So here's how you do it. So we have a create column chart uh, function, which will get the sheet. I'm going to start uh, looking at the data. I want to skip the header row, because that has just column names. It doesn't have any data. So I want to start with the data. So start with uh, cell A2 going up to cell B11. So if you go back mentally, you'll see that. Uh, and then we're going to start putting the chart at row, uh, row 5, column 5. And so all we do here is we just request a new chart to get created. We want a columnar chart. We, uh, the range is going to be start cell from A2 down to B11. And then I'm going to set the position of the chart, build the chart, insert the chart, and then I'm done. There we are. Yay. That's the next step. But now what? We can do even better than this. Yes, I know you're really, really uh, hand-holding your managers here. But we can do better than giving them a spreadsheet. Okay. We want to make it presentable. So that's where Google Slides comes in. So we want to build a slide deck. So we have a title and a subtitle. OK, so let's show how to do that. So here is create slide presentation. Same query name as before. So this is all part of the same app, by the way. 
And then I'm going to get the page elements, which are the title and subtitle. Then I'm going to set the title, and then I set a subtitle because uh, the subtitle is here. The query name was a variable because we also had to create the spreadsheet, so that's why that was a variable. Otherwise, I would post a string here. Okay, so that's how you create a slide deck. Now we need to ingest the data from the spreadsheet so that it is in a table on a slide. So how do we do that? All right, so this time we do want the headers because we want to bring everything over from the spreadsheet. So we start at cell A1 and go down to B11 again. And so the first step is to insert a blank slide. Then I get the range from start cell to end cell, which is that entire range. And then I'm going to insert the table. And then I have a double for loop to populate every single cell of that table. So I have to uh, say I want to get the cell. I want to get the text box that's in the cell. Then I want to set this text with this string value. OK, so that's how you put the data into the table. Now, let's link to the chart in Sheets. Only two lines. Because the object already exists in the spreadsheet, all you need is a chart ID. So when you created the chart in, uh, using Google Sheets, you save the return value, which is the sh uh, chart ID. And so all you have to do is do append another blank slide and then insert the chart into it, and then it's done. OK, and so we're able to go from this to that. So you have a slide deck that has three slides that we just went through. Okay? Now that you can go and present to your managers right away. Right? You ran the big data query all the way to having a slide deck and you didn't lift a finger in between. Okay? So this is what I mean by going the final mile. Yes, you got your results, but now let's put it in a place where we can actually show our managers. Okay, so how did this app work? So this is an app script app. So what happens is uh, you can start your app script app from a desktop or from mobile. You send the request to BigQuery to, uh, to execute that query on your behalf. It returns the big data analytics. You store that into a spreadsheet. Then you build a chart. Then you call Google Slides and basically build a slideshow that has all this data in it. And then now you have something that you can present to managers. So that's the flow of that app. Now, let's see it run. There may be a little bit more action to this one, but um, maybe not. OK, so here's the script. Um, and it's create BigQuery uh, presentation. So I'm going to do the most common words in all of Shakespeare's works again. And then if I do this, of course, I don't have a Google Drive folder. I should have created a Drive folder. I should have the OAuth permissions. So in this code, when you look at it, there is no OAuth code. So that's, again, one of the benefits of using App Script is that all the uh, OAuth code is written for you. But the user still gets the prompt to authorize this script regardless, which is kind of cool. So I'm going to review the permissions. I have not run this demo yet from this account. So let's, let's do a live demo in front of everyone. Okay? Since I didn't publish this app, it's not verified. So the question is, do I trust myself? Depends what time of the day I'm coding. <laughs> so I trust myself. And it says, I want to view and manage your data in BigQuery, view and manage your spreadsheets in Drive. This is looking promising, by the way. And then view and manage your Google Slides presentation. So I'm going to allow this code to run. Cross fingers. It's running, running, running. Oh, crap. Project, this, this user does not have access. All right. I was taking a risk. All right. Yes, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. I'm just going to go to Drive. Oh, I hope I shared it with myself. Share it with me. Please be in here. Of course I didn't. <laughs> OK, my fault. So anyway, it works. Trust me. OK. <laughs> if to you don't believe him, you can go look at the code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I was going to do is I'm going to show you that deck. And then I was going to show you two other queries that I did that is not the most popular words in Shakespeare. So I have one, which I already preloaded, which is the most popular long works in Shakespeare. OK, so these are these words. OK, and here's that. And then the other one I did was in, to break away from Shakespeare, what are the effects of uh, drinking alcohol uh, with newborns? And so this was a corpus uh, from the neonatality database from 1952 to 1965, roughly. And um, you know, basically, the, the mothers had to say, were, were they drinking alcohol during the time of their pregnancy? And so there's a yes, no, and also no answer. And you can see that there's a little bit of a difference for people who did have alcohol use. 
So you can run any kind of query that you want on it. Um, and BigQuery has awesome public data. This is all public data that's available in BigQuery already. So anyway, so I, I don't, uh, I'll have to check on the project. But anyway, trust me that it works. OK. So the summary is you can leverage GCP from the G Suite side. For example, in this case, we're taking BigQuery and doing big data analysis on it. Um, but I, my I'm trying to encourage you to do is to go that final mile. You did all this hard work, but let's just take it one step further and put it into a spreadsheet, not only as data source, but you can actually use it to generate a chart or something visual. So obviously, the, I only showed you one type of chart, which is the columnar chart. But spreadsheets can do a lot more different types of charts than that. Okay, so it's very important to know that. You can have different types of visualization. And then there's, of course, Google Slides that you can use to generate all those slide decks that you can just straight, take straight to management. And it's all glued together by G Suite Serverless. So you can build this app on your own uh, using the code lab that we have. So it's available at the short link. Uh, it's already been live for a while. And if you do come to the code lab and you find the, uh, the intro code lab's a little too easy, you can go ahead and do that one. And uh, some of us will walk you through it as well, too. Um, and then, of, of course, the, uh, the source code is also available on, on GitHub as of two nights ago. Yay. Uh, so you can go check out the source code as well and then try it for yourself. OK, so what is next? So, uh, so what we just did was give you an idea showing you two sample apps that are fairly different, right? But we're using a combination of four different GCP APIs and four different G Suite APIs you know, with the t between the two apps put together. So what else can you do? So I just want to make you guys think, or make you all think at, at, you know, at your problems at work or uh, challenging issues you have in the office for, or for your customers or even for yourselves, what kind of things that you could do knowing that you can code both at the same time. So the next step for you is using your imagination. So we're going to give you three ideas. And by the way, if you actually end up building these apps, please share them with me. I'm, I'm curious as to what people build with our stuff. So I'd like to see these apps built. One of them is uh, I'd like to ask everybody, how many of you out there have a big, giant terab uh, terabyte uh, hard drive at home where you dump all your uh, pictures from your camera's uh, SD card? And it's just sitting there. Right? Yes, I know some of you are laughing. OK, it's true. But if you write code, you can actually make some magic happen. Because you can uh, leverage G Suite and GCP again to do some work for you. So for example, the Google Drive API, if you put all your pictures in Drive, the Drive API gives you access to the um, image media metadata. And same thing goes for videos, but there's a lot more metadata for photos because you have the date and time, you have the geolocation. You can actually use just that data alone to build photo albums. So you never have just pictures sitting there with no, you know, no, no reason, right? So that's that. If for some reason you don't have any image metadata, they're just old photos uh, and stuff like that, you can upload those to Google Cloud Storage and then use the Vision API to give you some information on those. Or if you have videos, you can use the Video Intelligence API that can scan your videos frame by frame to tell you, you know, whether you want to know sentiment, whether you want to do OCR or whatnot. So you can use those like APIs. Detect faces to do that. in them or things like that. Too. Yeah, exactly. So you can get a lot of information. And in fact, overall, you can not only extract metadata, but you can even make videos and photos searchable in addition to creating photo albums. Okay? So we really want you to go from this to that. You can auto-generate collages, photo albums, without even touching the files, the photo files or the movie files, just by running a little bit of code. OK? So that's one example. Now, another issue that we have is, can't we be a little bit more efficient with our time? You can actually create a tool to make this happen. You can, scan, you can use the Google Calendar API. You can scan all your meetings, all your, your appointments. And you can make possible optimizations based on using our Cloud ML APIs, such as perhaps grouping meetings to specific days or searching for occasions where maybe you're not making good use of your time. All right? And then the other thing you can do is you can auto-schedule meetings with contacts and with teams. Like if you have team meetings every week or customer meetings every quarter or monthly, you know, it's up to you to decide. But you can use a Gmail API for that, the Calendar API for that. You can find the optimal day and time for all parties. Right? So all these things are possible. Uh, another example is maybe, maybe you had four customers email you just as you were getting on the plane to come to Cloud Next. And you really want to respond to them, but, but you don't have had a chance to reply yet. Well, guess what? You can automate that. 
Uh, Ace already showed you how to use PubSub to get notifications of new email messages. Maybe you can you know, add some code or add some logic to tell who your important customers are. And if it recognizes that, maybe you can auto send a reply going, hey, I'm off to a conference, but uh, we've, I've scheduled a meeting with us together to chat next week. And you didn't even have to schedule the meeting yourself. Your code did that for you. Okay, so something like that. And then the third example is, what do your customers feel about your product? All right, it's a really important thing because that actually determines whether you should stay in business or not, right? Okay, so you can actually perform sentiment analysis. Uh, if you look at all the different feedback, all the different feedback channels, uh, you can analyze them. So, you know, look at all your support emails. Look at all the Twitter posts and direct messages that you get. Check out all what the press and the media are saying about your product or your company. And check blog posts where, you know, people are writing about your product. You can use the Natural Language API from GCP to determine the user sentiment. You can use the Cloud ML Engine and TensorFlow to build and train your own predictive models if, you know, you want more than just language processing. And then you can use G Suite APS to track all this stuff in a spreadsheet or in a Google Doc. And then you can set up appropriate meetings with Google Calendar again, just like in the previous example. Okay, so that's another example of what I want to see you guys do. So you get the hang of it now. So think about some problems that you want to solve and leverage GCP and G Suite to make it happen. All right, so to wrap up, serverless is logic hosting in the cloud at Google scale. It's mostly my definition, all right, not the Wikipedia one. Uh, means that you don't have to provision or manage resources. Uh, there's more time for you to work on that idea, you know, that the inspiration that I gave you to think about what other challenging problems that you want to solve for your company as well as for your customers. And, you know, using G Suite and GCP by themselves is great, but I think the combination of the two is more potent. I think you have more, uh, more ability to build the apps that you really want to build by combining both of them together. Uh, again, to kind of like wrap up, why am I giving this talk? Why serverless? Why GCP and G Suite? Why all of these app ideas and demos? Well, ultimately, we want you to be successful. And if you're a customer, we want you to be a happy customer. All right, so thanks for coming. All right, before we get off the stage, more next steps. So what can you do now, hands on? Code Labs, App Script Code Lab, App Maker Code Lab, and there's a whole bunch of GCP Code Labs. So this is a definitely a photo opportunity. And, um, like I said, we're going to go through the App Script Code Lab as well as the App Maker one, and one for uh, the G Suite APIs on Friday at the boot camp. So please join us on Friday afternoon. There are also tutorials for Cloud Functions, App Script, and App Maker that you can follow. And then uh, I also do videos, as you'll probably know. And then there's also a lot of GCP developer videos as well. So those are some references for you. And uh, if you want to look up related sessions at Next when you go back home and check out the videos. So besides the boot camp on Friday, there's also a talk given by the AppScript team uh, that was CP131. So they announced sort of like a roadmap and new features. Uh, we gave a talk on the first day also about serverless telling you how to write a serverless app from top to bottom. There was another Cloud Functions overview uh, uh, earlier today at 11 that you can watch. There will be a talk tomorrow morning about AppMaker starting at 9. So this is the developer talk. We, there was another talk for AppMaker earlier uh, in the conference that was mostly for uh, managers uh, and decision makers. But this one is more for developers and will show you how you, act, you can actually build line of business workflows uh, in AppMaker. There's also another talk earlier uh, yesterday on certain integrations between BigQuery specifically and Google, uh, Google Spreadsheets, Google Sheets. So you can watch that talk. And then there uh, is a spotlight that happened uh, yesterday as well on serverless running on Google Cloud. So you should check that one out as well. And please give us feedback on, uh, on this session uh, in the app or on the website, which shows up in the, uh, the slides that will rotate after, after we get off the stage. All right. Thank you all for coming.